She was never sentimental, never a party tub thumper, and being a woman, she has regularly been written off as a minor artist. That she was not, and for a vision of a world that was at the same time clear, estranged, bleakly funny, and poisoned at the root, nobody could touch him. In order for art to assert itself as radical, it needed to take political sides in this atmosphere. 1918 brought the end of the German monarchy and a republic was proclaimed in the city of Weimar. Between the assaults of the left and the right, the Weimar Republic lasted 15 years until Hitler finally snuffed it out. The first of its crises was a general socialist rising in November 1918, a year after the Russian Revolution. The left hoped to demolish the Prussian war machine for good, but it rolled over them. Strikes were answered by martial law, and there were many young and radical artists who went with the rebels to the left of the Republic. Now, there already was a strong thread of protest against war and authority in German art. It came from Expressionism, one of whose tenets was that there were no political solutions, only spiritual ones which must be made by artists. But to younger painters, the Expressionists didn't seem objective. blown apart. To place one's sensitive ego above the whole of the world struck them as arrogant self-pity, and that was what Expressionism tended to do. When Ernst Ludwig Kirchner was in the army, he painted himself with his painting hand cut off like a mutilated saint, a man symbolically castrated by war. In fact, he had never been wounded. This hill is called the Buch de Valencourt, and during the Battle of the Somme, Tens of thousands of men died for it. The place became a symbol of obsession, first held by German machine gunners, then captured by British and Australian troops, then taken again by the Germans, and finally stormed again by the Allies. And this went on from the autumn of 1916 for two years. By the end of World War I, every yard of ground here had been dug up by high explosive, mixed with human flesh and bone, and pulverized and buried again down to a depth of six feet. In such places as this, our grandfathers tasted the first terrors of the 20th century. And the life of words and images in art was changed radically and forever because our culture had now entered the age of mass-produced, industrialized death. And at first, there were no words to describe it. In 1914, not one man or woman in Europe had any real idea what total mechanized warfare would mean. Europe had been at peace for 44 years, and nobody of draft age remembered a war. Their authorities sold the war to them in a language of rhetorical cliches that descended from chivalry, the language of the public school and the officers' mess. In the trenches, millions of young Englishmen, Frenchmen and Germans found the idea that war was something between a joust and a cricket match had been wrecked by inventions which industrialised death as they had industrialised life. This was what they found and what they became. By 1916, in the summer catastrophes of the Somme battlefield, a whole generation on both sides of the trenches was becoming aware that it had been lied to. Its generals had lied about the nature and the length of the war. Its politicians had lied about its causes. Its journalists and propagandists had lied about what it was like for the troops. The flood of lies was so great that it seemed to contaminate all official language. And so a chasm opened between official language and what the young knew to be reality. The speech of the elders could not contain their experiences. America would repeat this trauma in the 60s with Vietnam. But Europe had it 50 years earlier, and the antennae of the crisis were the ones whose business was language. The writers and artists, mostly born between 1890 and 1900, who had been sucked into the vast statistics of the war. I knew a man, he was my chum, but he grew blacker every day and would not brush the flies away, however fierce the hum of passing shells. I used to read to rouse him random things when he could tell he was far gone. For he lay gaping, mackerel-eyed and stiff and senseless as a post. 
even when that old poet cried, I long to talk with some old He stank so soul. badly, though we were great chums, I had to leave him. Then rats ate his thumbs. World War I destroyed an entire generation. We don't know and we can't even guess what might have been painted or written if the war had never happened. Its imagery of waste, repetition, irony, loss and pain is so built into our whole idea of modernity that we simply take it for granted. We can't see its alternative. As for the waste of minds, we know the names of some who were killed too soon, among the painters and Beppo Boccioni and Franz Marc, the sculptor Gaudier Bresca, the architect Saint Alia, the poets Isaac Rosenberg and Wilfred Owen. But for every one of those whose name survived, there must have been scores and possibly those hundreds. who never simply got a chance to develop. And so, if you were to ask, where is the Picasso of England or the Ezra Pound of France, the probable answer is that they... Above all, what the war produced to its survivors and onlookers was a longing for a clean slate, a sense of spiritual apocalypse. In return, they would be pacifists, internationalists. They would get out of the war if possible, but to where? The closest neutral country was Switzerland. Zurich attracted every sort of intellectual refugee from Northern Europe. Today, the phrase cafe intellectual is a mild, obsolete insult. But then it was not a cafe, but they had a cultural one. Places like this one, the Odeon in Zurich, were cultural institutions. They were, in an almost literal sense, mediums of discourse. It was also the marketplace of ideas for exile. Mediums of discourse. It was also the marketplace of ideas for exiles. Mediums of discourse. Great ones like Lenin and James Joyce, but a host of others. People who are separated from the patterns of their society, whether by choice or not, still need a forum. They need a place where they can go to meet and drink, mediums talk, of discourse, preen themselves, or simply sit alone with a book, like magazines. They had fled their natural homeland. They say that sex is the poor man's opera, but the cafe was the opera of the dissenters. They had fled their natural homeland. It was also the marketplace of ideas for exiles, mediums of discourse. They had fled their natural homelands. And modernism was very much the creation of exiles. Whether you're talking about Picasso, the Spaniard, or Joyce and Beckett, the Irish. And modernism was very much the creation of exiles. When Stalin declared war against what he called ruthless cosmopolitans in the 30s, he was, in effect, attacking the Odeons and those who sat in. But even so, the revolution that brought him to power was partly hatched in this very room by Lenin, who was a regular at the Odeon in 1960. Among the other denizens of the Odeon were a Romanian poet named Tristan Zara, a painter named Marcel Janko, a sculptor from Alsace, Jean Arp, and a German writer named Hugo Barr. In the cafes of Europe, the intellectuals got their sense of being a class, the mandarins of change. It was Baal who decided to start a cultural cabaret a club where they could all perform and read their work and show their painting. He rented the ground floor of a building in the Spiegelgasse and called it the Café Voltaire. And here, a movement was born. Its name was Dada. A nonsense name. Dada meant yes, yes in Russian. It meant a rocking horse in Romanian. In any language, it was one of the child's first utterances. The word Dada signified the desire to go back to scratch, the impossible project of starting culture all over again from the beginning, uncontaminated by the language of the elders. Marcel Yanko made theatre masks for the evenings at the Café Voltaire. Gaudy, primitive things run up with cardboard and poster paint. Hugo Baal conducted mock rituals on the cafe stage in costume and gibberish. 
His idea of a gratuitous art at the end of history, whose full stop had been written by the machine in the Great War, was what Dada adopted along with the full range of publicity tricks. Provocation was the essential business of Dada, its claim to modernity. It was art's parody of revolution. But futurism wanted to abolish the past in the name of the machine, whereas the Dadaists wanted to produce an innocence whose metaphor was child. We searched for an elementary art that would, we thought, save mankind from the furious madness of these times. We wanted an anonymous and collective art. And, uh, well, it was one of these gestures, because I had a little moustache and a goatee, and also wrote underneath something very whiskey. The letters, pronounced as the French pronounced them, mean she's got a hot ass. These simple experiments gave the lingering impression that the Dadas were against art itself. Now it's true that in the years before 1920, not only in Zurich, but also in Paris and New York, there were some very pointed jabs at the cult of art and its priests, the dealers and critics. The strongest influence on the Dadaists in Zurich was futurism. In Italy, before the war, Marinetti had already shown how to grab an audience with manifestos and stunts. Especially they came from Marcel Duchamp, almost toy-like. Not only a jab at the middle-brow worship of the artist as divine creator, but also a pun on Leonardo's own homosexuality. Then there was Duchamp's urinal, which he exhibited as a fountain and signed R. Mutt. So they just took the thing and threw it away above the partition. Arp offended all the conventions of sculpture by making simple jigsaw reliefs of... It said, in effect, that the world was so full of interesting objects that the artist need not add to them. Instead, he could just pick one. And this ironic act of choice was equivalent to creation. Jocanda was another thing that um, I made it here in Paris in 1919 before going back to America. And modernism was very much the creation of exile.